everyone. Um, this is Professor Arun Koshik from the University of Sussex um, in the UK. And welcome to the podcast on non-terrestrial networks for global connectivity. Today I have with me Professor Muhammad Jishan Shakir from the University of the West of Scotland in the UK as well. And I would like Professor Shakir to, to introduce himself, to say something. Well, thank you very much, Aryan. So yes, I am um, uh, Mohammed Zishan Shakir, and I'm a professor of wireless technologies in the University of the West of Scotland. And I'm also director of uh, UWS Digital Connectivity and Innovations for Sustainable Future Research Group within our School of Computing, Engineering and Physical Sciences. Uh, today, we are going to talk about our research that we're doing together um, and the areas of 6G wireless communications and non-terrestrial uh, telecommunication networks that includes the use of drones, flying platforms and tethered and tethered balloons as well. Yes. Um, so just getting into the topic. So um, non-terrestrial networks is something that is quite hot at the moment, especially when we talk about impl implementations into our 6G services, 5G advanced and 6G services. And one thing that is very important is non-terrestrial networks basically um, has many entities. So you can go from, let's say, your LEO satellites, geo satellites, um, and then you can also include your hot air balloons, your UAVs, um, which is unmanned aerial vehicles, and any sort of flying platforms. So basically, you can have these different entities, and then the, you can integrate these with ground network as well. So basically, they are... Um, sort of um, giving each other this push of, of the latest technology that terrestrial network is actually supported with these non-terrestrial sort of entities. So this is something that we are we are heading into in that direction. That is the integration of our air and our space network with actually the ground network and how they actually complement each other. So this is very important sort of direction. Um, one thing in non-trusting networks when we talk about the entities, so we do, we will talk about satellites, we do talk about satellites as well, but one thing is which is very important as well is flying platforms, so how flying platforms will play a role. So I would like to ask you, Dishan, um, what do you think, why UAVs or these unmanned aerial vehicles as we call them, UAVs, right? So why are they popular and what's really the role of UAVs into, into non-trusting networks? Yeah, this is very timely uh, research that that we are trying to do in this area of UAVs and their integration with the 5G networks. We know that there are a number of efforts going on right now to uh, roll out 5G networks all around the world, but it is important to understand there are billions of uh, population all around the world without good quality of the internet. So there is a part of the population which are still not connected. So connecting that unconnected population or connecting those unconnected uh, geographical regions as a key important problem that we want to address now when we move towards design and development of 6G networks. So we believe that the flexibility of the flying platforms like drones, UAVs, and uh, high altitude platforms or medium altitude platforms or low altitude platforms uh, is a key to, ex to be exploited and to bring the connectivity to those areas where there is no infrastructure or it is difficult to build one because it would be not cost effective to build a brand new, right from scratch, a infrastructure just to provide the connectivity over there. And it has become very costly for the operators. Maybe there are not many use cases out there. And that is perhaps one of the reasons for the operators or other uh, key stakeholders not to provide the coverages to those geographical areas or the countries or the regions. So we believe that these flying platforms could provide connectivity in a flexible manner to those areas. This is one element of it. Another element of these UAVs or flying platforms is that they can uh, improve the resilience in the network. Let me define the resilience. So resilience is the reactiveness in the network, how quickly we can build the network in the case of a scenario when there is no networking or there is no connectivity. For example, there is a disaster or for example, there is a malfunctioning in a 5G networks. So users are still required to access the broadband or mobility uh, solutions 
So we can send out these UAVs or the flying platforms to those areas. And we can also pop up these tethered balloons as a flying base stations and provide connectivity to those users in those areas. Yes, sounds great. Actually, that's very well put. Yeah. Um, so just kind of continuing on that uh, track. Mm-hmm. Um, so generally, when we are you know, giving tutorials and, and, and kind of speeches, so there's always one question that pops up, is that how about the processing power um, that these UAVs and these flying platforms are going to use? Um, so w- what, do you, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, this is very important to realize the... Uh, hardware limitations of the flying platforms itself, you know. So we all know the drone industry or UAV industry or flying platform industry is very matured. There are a lot of variety out there in the market, but we must understand that they have very limited processing power on board. And we are talking about these flying platforms carry some transceivers with them and provide the connectivity down uh, to the ground users. So let's imagine moving forward, we are talking about um, UAVs or the drones carrying millimeter wave transmitters and then providing connectivity to the ground users. Yes. So you can imagine they would require a lot of uh, processing power on board. So what we believe that these UAVs would have a limited power on board and they will exploit the use of edge computing. So they would uh, only store relevant and important data on board while send away the rest of the data about the radio environment to the cloud. And the cloud would have uh, other means of connectivity, such as fiber would be there or connectivity through Leo satellites would be there to exploit it together uh, as a complete information and, uh, and and then use the resources, onboard resources, such as um, beam forming techniques, resource allocations effectively for the drones to perform effectively in those radio environments or scenarios and situations. Yes, w- very, very good. Um, so basically, when we talk about sort of ecosystem of NTN, so certainly, as, as you have put, UAVs will play a big role and there will be some sort of swarm UAVs that we can use actually um, in, in many use scenarios, yep. which we'll discuss later as well. Um, so another thing that I wanted to mention was that how NTNs are actually aligned with, um, let's just say, the 6G commercialization or 6G um, standardization sort of aspects, right? Um, so, I, I mean, have you got any thoughts on that? Well, uh, for standardization perspectives, uh, uh, UAVs or NTN networks are not far. We are looking at they are going to be part of the 6G networks uh, moving forward, like in the next 10 to 20 years. And uh, there are different uh, regulatory bodies who have study groups. Um, they are looking into studying their radio channels and looking at their integration with the users or use them as a backhaul. So different use cases are being considered as well. And they are trying to look into it, how they can bring it to the reality. Yes. Um, let me let me ask this question, Aryan, that what do you think? You have been working on several standardization bodies uh, and you know a lot about the uh, 6G networks as well. So what do you think, what are your thoughts that how these NTN networks would shape up the future generation of uh, 6G networks? Yes. Um, so Jishan, so where we are actually at the moment, so recently if you see um, that we have one IMT 2030 6G vision and framework being approved by ITOR. So in that one, they have presented many sort of usual scenarios um, where you have integration of AI with communications, Mm -hmm. you have integration of sensing and communications, um, you want to provide um, super, hyper, in fact, reliable and low latency communication. And there are many other usual scenarios as well. So the idea here is that NTN really falls into that category um, where you can use all these technologies and you can actually provide these services as well um, using non trustier networks. So, for example, if you're talking about... So there have been actually many examples as well. I mean, I would like to put through... Um, so Apple had done, let's say they use Global Star, Helio satellites, right? They have Global Star has 24 sort of low Earth orbit 
um, satellites. So they make use of them for emergency SOS services already. So last year they had done it. Then there is Huawei, then there is Motorola, and then mm -hmm. the biggest key player is actually SpaceX, if you talk about that. So um, T-Mobile and SpaceX have come together to kind of give 100% coverage for remote areas in the U.S., if you talk about North America in general. So the thing is that we are actually inclined with this 6G vision and framework already. And we can see these applications being put through. Some initial applications, of course, but we can see them being put through already around us, right? Some real world mm. applications. Yeah. Um, so basically, in my in my understanding, you can use different sort of spectrums as well as, as, as we speak. Um, so you can go for um, the frequency range one, which is basically your sort of mid-band um, sort of frequencies around three, four gigahertz, like yeah. sub six gigahertz frequencies. And you can also go beyond, you can go for your 5G NR sort of services, right? Where you go beyond 28 gigahertz, 25 gigahertz, you go further, right? Um, and then when I talk about 60 vision and framework, when you're implementing sensing and communication together, you can actually use those signals, that signaling together with non-trusted network. Mm -hmm. So your satellite is not only sending just a communication signal, it can send a dual function signal, which is having both the mm -hmm. characteristics, sensing and communications. Yeah. So you can actually align all these things together and we do see some real world applications um, as well. And in terms of, let's say, um, the global market value, it is actually forecast mm. that by 2025 or 2026, it will be doubled. So whatever we see now, the technology mm. will be much more mature yeah. in next couple of years. And also the global market value will, will really get um, yeah. doubled. Yeah. So there is a very bright future, I mean, yeah, if you ask no, me. Yeah. I understand that. But talking about the global market and the revenue that the industry will get out of the deployment of NTN-based networks, what do you think, what are the timeline uh, when these networks with the NTN would be commercialized uh, for operators to deploy? Yeah, so, so the main idea actually is that we need more and more industry people to come in together to actually implement these things, to have the satellite direct access to the smartphone as well. So we mm. want to talk about um, something on the grounds of, let's say, your mobile should be like a mini sort of satellite, mm. right? Because it can give all these functionalities yeah. that your satellite is able to do, if not all, at least many of these. Yeah. Um, so, so in terms of the timeliness, so we have seen many... Uh, real world examples, as I was mentioning, through through you know Apple, through uh, there is another one with Qualcomm and, and Iridium. They have done things as well. Then there are some other key players like SpaceX is there. So then there is OneWeb, Teleset, and and so on. But we need more industry players coming together because at the moment we have problem with the cost. Yeah. So the bottleneck is actually the cost. You have very nice looking solutions, but how you actually implement them? and commercially provide yeah. them to the users, right? Um, so basically that is something that needs to be cut down. So the cost needs to be cut down. And when there are more industry players coming into together and standardization bodies, yeah. then the cost will be cut down further. Yeah. Complexity will be lower. Yeah. Like you were mentioning about the processing power. Yeah. So complexity is, is a big bottleneck when it you is. talk about this ecosystem of many non-trusting network entities. Yeah. Yeah. If I be optimistic, so in 2025 or 2026, you can see... Um, basically more mature versions of what we see now. So it will not only be emergency SOS services. You will see much more sort of integration of satellite non-trusting networks. You can see the direct access to mm. your smartphones through the satellite signaling. Yeah. Um, so this is what I see. I mean, again, when 6G is going to come in 2030, yeah. you will see much more mature version of it. Yeah, no, I think it's quite natural. Whenever we see new solutions or new technology, they are very expensive at the start of its uh, use. And then when it's become popular, when it's uh, getting being deployed for masses, you know, the production line will improve. Uh, and then manufacturing a number of, you know, larger sites and all that stuff, you know, would reduce the exactly. cost of the solution itself. And its maintenance and uh, deployment will also get reduced as well. Yeah, uh, This is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I would like to add, actually, on this is is the spectrum harmonization that we mm -hmm. talk about. So we are using some spectrums for our cellular, current cellular networks, right? So mm -hmm. how do they actually, um, you know, enable, let's say, um, the satellite communication as well at the same time mm -hmm. when you're talking about cellular networks? So this is very important, and it really depends on the regulators, 
right? So the regional regulators. For example, there is one LEO satellite, so it can have wide coverage over many regions, many countries, in fact, right? Many states as well. So basically, if it has deep coverage like this, it has wide coverage like that, um, then when you want to use a spectrum, which is assigned for that particular cellular network, so coexisting becomes really difficult, right? Yeah. Because you want to use the same frequency band for your cellular networks and for your the satellite coverage as well. And the problem is because many regional sort of, um, you know, state governments, you can say, or, or, or the guys who are actually deciding these spectrum bands. So this really needs a bit of coordination with the industry partners as well, the industry kind of service providers, that how you allocate this spectrum as well. So this is one of the technical challenges, I think, yeah. at both the frequency ranges, yeah. low frequency and high frequency both. What do you think? Yeah, I think this is very important to understand the challenges when you look at the real resource that we have in terms yes. of the spectrum, you know. And when it becomes the coexistence of the technology, we need to look at the physical layer challenges. There will be enormous amount of physical layer challenges that we would face in terms of resource allocation, interference management, uh, in-band, out-band, backhauling, and all these things need to be looked after before yes. these solutions uh, becomes viable. And what do you think about um, artificial intelligence mm in non-trusting networks? What's the role of that? What do you think about that? Well, this is a hugely popular topic now when we are talking about research in 5G or 6G networks and role of artificial intelligence in there. Uh, uh, we have a, a funded project uh, by QNRF. And in this project, we are looking at how artificial intelligence could enhance uh, the reality of UAVs uh, to provide the coverage for 5G or 6G networks. So one way of using the AI is to design a trajectory journey for these UAVs. Imagine we talked about it earlier, these UAVs would fly and go to those zones or areas where there is no network or there is no coverage. Maybe it is broken or it is over congested. Like path, path planning. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what we would do is we would uh, use artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithm to learn about the radio environment on the fly and then UAV can optimize its journey when it is moving from point A to point B, where the coverage is required, and then optimize its journey and go there. So they're not necessarily hoovering there. They maybe go there in a, a location where they can place themselves nicely and then provide the coverage to the users uh, as a flying base stations uh, to those users, which uh, they have mobile phones, but they do not have any base station to connect with. So they would connect with these flying base stations and then uh, get the entire mobile services uh, to let their friends and family if they are doing good, you know. So AI could be used for path planning, for trajectory planning. AI could also be used to predict the mobility for these users. Yes. For example, these UVs would fly to go and provide the coverage to a crowd of users. But at a, another timestamp, these UVs will move away. So what we are trying to do in our research is applying, for example, federated learning and try to uh, predict the mobility of the future and, uh, and uh, future mobility of the users and also try to find out if there would be a coverage in that time, no coverage in that time zone, okay? For example, if the users have a percentage of the users move from one point to other point, and there will be no coverage, there will be a not a spot in that time zone. So UAVs could particularly go there. So we can, pl path, we can plan their path and we can also identify the location where there could be no coverage because of the mobility of the users, okay? We can use existing mobility models. There are lots of mobility models that exist, you know, and we can uh, predict the users' uh, uh, mobility in future, and also we can predict if there could be uh, no coverage and we can send those UAVs. So path planning, mobility uh, predictions, yes. and finding an optimal placement for those UAVs yeah. could be some of the key... Uh, solutions that we can get from these emerging intelligent tools or algorithms, you know. Yeah. yeah, I think this this is very well put, and it reminds me of some of the research that me and my group are also working on. Um, is basically how you can use AI algorithms in in satellite sort of applications as well. So let's let's say when you are having multiple satellites on an edge plane, right? Mm -hmm. You have these inter-satellite links which are being operated at this. Um, through edge computing and then you also plug in some cloud computing there as well that you store some information on the cloud as you were mentioning in 
uh, the case of UAVs as well, right? So you can actually plug in these um, edge computing, cloud computing solutions there. And in my group, we have been working on deep reinforcement learning approaches for intelligent resource allocation. So what happens is that you have some computing resources, you have communication resources as well that you want to use, but you don't need to use all of these altogether. Yeah. So through the use of edge computing, cloud computing, and unsupervised AI, unsupervised machine learning approaches, you can actually enable this sort of tier network architecture and, and you can enable, you know, you can come up with really uh, advanced technical solutions for your LU satellites. Another thing, even for UAVs in, in terms of public safety applications, so when you're sending your UAVs as, as, as relays, right, collecting the information, sending it back to the base station, you can run it through an AI algorithm, right, the, the path planning, the trajectory, and also the process of getting, you know, relaying this information back there can be also based on unsupervised machine learning. So my group has also worked on on, on, on these um, topics and very interesting topics. Okay, Jishan. Mm. So we did talk about the technical hurdles and, and challenges that we face actually in NTN, especially in the light of, of, of you know, Elio satellites yeah. that we are going to, you know, commercialize in, in the next few years. I mean, our, our industrial partners and our, our, our friends in, you know, service providers and stuff. Um, so another, another thing that I wanted to actually go back to the, to the first question was um, that you did discuss about how, I mean, how important UAVs are. So I would like you to kind of stretch a bit more on that. That's what do you think about the role of UAVs? What kind of role they can play into, into NTNs specifically? And, and if you see any technical challenges and any, any hurdles mm. with UAVs in NTNs? Yeah, this is, this is very relevant, Aryan. So what happened, we, we believe that these UAVs will become the part of the 6G or future generations of the network. And these UAVs are not going to uh, replace the existing terrestrial network, no. So they are going to complement the existing network. They will fly like a swarm of UAVs, okay? So some of the UAVs will fly at a lower altitude, okay? Very close to the ground. And some of the UAVs will fly in a medium of uh, in our environment in a stratosphere. And some of them would fly very high, like LEO satellites, you know, like HAPS and beyond that, you know. Yes. Uh, HAPS are flying particularly at the height of uh, 10 kilometers or 12 kilometers. And satellites are beyond that, you know. So we are thinking that these UAVs will fly as a swarm and then some of these at the lower layer would provide the physical layer services like they would uh, they would behave as a flying base stations right so for example there is a need to provide a coverage so these UAVs will pop up and then provide the connectivity to those areas or to those users where where there is no connectivity or the base station is broken or malfunctioning or etc and etc so these are the uavs flying at a lower altitude there is a uavs flying at an altitude in the middle somewhere they would behave as a relay so they would relay the lower layer with the higher layer and you can imagine the higher layer altitude platforms or uavs or or high altitude platforms flying at an altitude of 10 kilometer or beyond they would serve as a uh, providing a backhaul to the rest of the airborne network. You can think of these uh, LEO satellites uh, providing connectivity to uh, to these UAVs and providing backhaul to these uh, UAVs as well. So UAVs can behave as a small cell, flying base stations as well. Another unique use case that we thought that these UAVs could be very useful as behaving as a small cell hubs, right? One of the key challenge, you know, that we face with the small cell is the availability of the cost-effective backhauling. Aryan, you would agree with me that uh, uh, small cells have been with us since long, you know, yes. since 4G networks. But the key challenge these small cells, you know, they have faced is the, is the availability of the backhauling and the front hauling for these small cells. The, the, the microwave link is limited and fiber is not available everywhere. We mm -hmm. know that it, the cost of the fiber is too much because it, it is being costed at per unit of the distance. So uh, UAVs can be used as a backhaul hubs or front hall hubs for these small cells to aggregate the wireless links with these small cells and then uh, connect it with the core network. These UAVs are not necessarily hoovering or moving all the time. So we are thinking that UAVs will fly and latch themselves in a facility or on top of the building where they have a battery available, 
where they have a, a, a fiber available or other resources that they would require. So they will latch themselves nicely and then provide services to those small sales and behave as a backhaul hub. There are key challenges now. For example, how many small sales you can associate it with that UAV and how you can provide the uh, connectivity, like what type of channel you can exploit. For example, you want to use a millimeter wave technology or you want to use FSO. If you want to use FSO, then there are limited uh, amount of uh, you know availability for those FSO. If you are working in an urban areas, for example, you always need to maintain line of sight. Um, but, but when you talk about... Um, uh, high altitude platforms providing uh, connectivity to to small cells as a backhaul hub. You can use that as well. It's another use case. You can take these backhaul hubs instead of uh, deploying them on the ground. You can take this up to the ground. And this is what we did in one of our work that was uh, published in IEEE communication magazines. Uh, so in that work, what we said that they, these high altitude platforms flying at an altitude of 10 kilometer they can behave as a flying hub for these small cells. And then those challenges that we could face when we have FSO on ground, uh, connecting uh, with the horizontal uh, uh, FSO uh, uh, beams because of the horizontal line of sight is difficult to maintain, you know. So we can take the line of sight vertically and then we can connect the small cells in the two hops with these uh, UAVs. That could perhaps provide more viable solution. It's like a fiber in the air and uh, more realistic. So just to summarize, you know, backhauling for small cells or uh, either on the ground or in the higher in the in the stratosphere or UAVs could serve as a as a uh, flying base stations. So these are the emerging use cases that we could adopt in 6G networks. Yes, perfect, Jishan. Um, I think this makes really a lot of sense. So when you were talking about UAVs actually um, being, you know, being used up, sort of co-channeling with your cellular network that you yeah. have with small cells and all. So this fits very well into the discussion of LEO satellites as well, yeah. that what kind of spectrums you can use for both the applications go together, um, kind of co coexisting with the... Um, with the with the um, satellite communication, let's say, right. So I mean, it is difficult and maybe you know sort of impossible to coexist them at lower frequencies, already congested, already you have used up. But then you can actually move on to the higher frequency range of millimeter wave or sub terahertz. Yeah. It can give you some sort of short range um, sort of communication, but still there are a lot of user scenarios there. Yeah. So. Yep. Let me let me catch up on the use cases area, and we did talk about the the, the global star uh, use case that we have right now that these NTN could provide the emergency services, and I think this is very important for now as you move towards building more resilient six G networks. What are the other use cases that these NTN networks or these flying platforms could bring into reality? So yeah, I can think about actually many use cases of mm -hmm. NTNs. Um, so first, I would like to give a bit of light, kind of shed a light on um, on intelligent meta surfaces, the one that we are using at the moment quite a lot mm -hmm. uh, in terms of at least theoretical research that we that we talk about. So wh when you have this smart radio environment using meta surfaces, so what happens is that you are not just plugging in some algorithm already done. You're actually adapting to the changes in your propagation environment. So what happens is, it's like a mirror, right? So you throw in some beam there, and then it can reflect towards an intended um, direction of, of a user, right? So basically, you have a lot of small unit cells on this big planar surface. It can be also cylindrical or any other shape. But the main idea is that you're actually reflecting the waves that are coming on this planar surface towards the intended user, right? Um, so why I want to inject this is that um, this thing has applications in, you know, millimeter wave and sub terahertz and so on. Because when you did talk about line of sight communication and long line of sight communication during the UAV sort of communication. Um, so here what happens is that, let's say, imagine if you have one equator, you know, one satellite on one side of the equator, another satellite on the other side of the equator. So they don't have this line of sight at all, right? So it's like really a lot of distance between these. So what happens is that, first of all, if you're talking about implementation of your satellite signals on high frequency, so in high frequency you have problems of 
you know, blockage effects there are, or there are some path loss effects and so on because of distance that you can have and high frequency, high bandwidth and so on and very low wavelength, right? So what happens here is that you can use these scenarios at high frequencies and also when you go the satellites on different side of the equator, you can use this intelligent matter surfaces as buffers on different satellites. So you have your signal starting from the other side of the equator, going to all the satellites, doing this mm. path, like in UAV swarm that you were mentioning, right? And it goes until the end. It keeps reflecting and it goes until the other side of the yeah. you know, you know, satellite at the equator. So this is one usual scenario that you can actually plug in intelligent surfaces, you can make it more adaptable to the change in, in the propagation environment and so on using these. And you can also implement these on high frequencies when you're talking about coexistence with the cellular network, which is possible on high frequency spectrum. So this is one. Second is that when you look at the 6G vision and framework, so we do have this objective of integrating sensing and communications together, right? So in that particular scenario, you can actually have a dual function signal that is basically sensing and communicating at the same time. So one best example of this is in public safety, right? So when you have, let's say, disaster, so we had, unfortunately, in southern Turkey mm. very recently, and, and you know that we have done a panel as well there. So this was also one of the, one of the key points of yeah. discussion. So basically, when um, you, you want to have the satellite coverage and so on, but at the same time, you want to also detect the objects available in that then disaster affected area, right? So you d just don't want to communicate, yeah. right? So let's say there was a base station serving that particular area yeah. and the link is broken yep. because of the disaster, right? Then what happens is that you can use this LEO satellite, you can send a dual functional signal, which is having both sensing uh, components and also communication transmission components. So you can detect whatever your car, your, your, you know, your devices that, are, that you want to detect, even people, for example, if they are enabled with this, um, let's say, sensor, right? And also you can communicate with the, with the mobile users on the ground. So it can really help in search and rescue operations quite a lot. So you are plugging in a lot of things and you don't have to use just one satellite. You can use multiple satellites using meta surfaces, yep. right? Intelligent meta surfaces, yep. RIS or holographic MIMO or whatever, whatever you like. So basically you can combine all these things together, mm -hmm. these all these technologies for public safety applications. Yep. Um, and then again, you can use your, your intelligent algorithms to, to, to process this, to have you know, good resource allocation. Um, basically when you want to sort of optimize what kind of computing resources or communication resources should go here. Yep. You are using edge computing, cloud computing, you can plug in your AI algorithms there for smartness of how the processing happens. Yeah. So these are some of the very important use cases that I actually see now. And also linking to emergency services provided by Apple or, or some other, let's say, service providers. So they can actually think in that direction as well. Okay, Jishan, so one very important thing I wanted to mention, so we are really approaching the, the conclusion of our podcast, um, was actually we did talk about UABs and LEO satellites separately. But one thing I would like to make it clear is that you can actually have all these things jointly in one under one network. So you can have the integration of these. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you have uh, different constellations of the satellite. So you have something less say, on, on, on 1,000 kilometers, something on 1,500, something a bit further. So you have a bit of mega constellation of your, you know, this LEO satellite. Same thing with UAVs. You have high altitude platform UAVs, you have medium altitude and low layer as well, right? And then all these are also kind of connected with each other. So when in a public safety scenario, when you're sending all this swarm of UAVs or you're using all these LEO satellites, this mega constellation yeah. satellites, so they can actually coordinate with each other. Mm -hmm. So they can check the information, sense the information, pass it back to the base station, especially in the scenario of, of, of um, you know, kind of relay the information, yeah. especially in the scenario of public safety application. So the, the idea here is that you can not only integrate just one unit or one layer of UAVs or one layer of your satellites with your ground network. You're going to actually have different layers of, you know, UAVs and different sort of constellations of your satellites as well. Yeah. They can all work together, right? You, you require advanced solutions, advanced technical solutions for these, but they can all be integrated together under one ecosystem, yeah. right? And um, so I think I think we mostly finished our our yes, podcast. I think, yeah. Um, there yeah. was one one article that we had published recently mm -hmm. 
in yeah. IEEE Comsoc sort yeah. of technology news. So um, would you like to tell our audience yeah, about that? Yeah, I think uh, that was a very timely topic that we published in uh, CTN uh, last year, was it December, are you, Andre? Yes. So yeah, we we tried to publish an, uh, uh, like cutting edge research going on in this area and try to provide a coverage to the audience, like what is next coming up? Um, so I would say some of the challenges that this particular topic is facing, you know, so they are there in the article. If you are interested in, please read that article. You will find more useful information. Before we conclude, I would like to say there are some challenges that these UAVs networks or flying platforms would face, such as um, uh, their placement or their trajectory and their its optimization, you know. So these are uh, there, but however, we have tools such as artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to, to be used together with them. For example, you can imagine UAVs are required to provide a connectivity in those areas what Arian has just talked about, like for example, in uh, emergency or safety areas. So we can uh, use artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms to design a safe corridor for these UAVs to fly through uh, and optimize their journey and traveling and then reach the point where they have all those resources to provide the connectivity. So, so think about this as a complete uh, a scenario that has lots of challenges, like how we design artificial intelligence and multidisciplinary problem, like how we model the, 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 the corridors and considering various, air, uh, you know, uh, strat stratosphere and other parameters in the environment before we model the uh, trajectory for these UAVs and their optimization. We need to consider wireless communication parameters as well. For, for example, UAVs to ground channel modeling uh, over a millimeter wave or terahertz and other frequency bands as well. Uh, availability of the hardware, processing units, and uh, and availability of the batteries, and so on and so forth. About that article as well that that we do mention about the trends and challenges of non-trusting networks and the trajectory. So basically, what we are projecting is that non-trusting networks would provide you sort of any any time, anywhere, anything connectivity. Um, so to speak, global connectivity that yep. we will have through the use of NTNs. And I would like to urge our audience yep. listening to this podcast yep. to please go through that article as well if you would like to know the trajectory of, of UAB satellites and basically non-trusted networks, yeah. what is happening and in terms of commercialization, yep. standardization, and, and so on. So I would like to refer to that as well. Yeah, I think that was a very relevant and timely article. Uh, it uh, gives the flavor of global connectivity. Yes. Like... It's not just for connecting the mobiles yes. to provide the voice or video services. So we are talking about providing uh, commun communication or, or connectivity to, to, to massive machine type communications, the sensing technologies, the yes. Internet of Things and many, many things, as Aryan, you said, everything. Internet, internet of space things, yes, we can internet call it. space <laughs> things. Yeah, yeah, internet of space things. So that's the concept of global connectivity. Yes. Uh, for can, can providing the connectivity to everything, everywhere. So very well said, Aryan. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank and you. Stay We're, tuned yeah. uh, to our um, future podcast and also our future tutorials. We have uh, our next tutorial to be delivered in IEEE, IEEE Globcom. Globcom. 2023 in Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur yes. So if you are planning to come to Globcom, uh, uh, we'll catch up with you. Yes, hope to see you there. Yeah, hope to see you there. Yeah, bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you.